Well, hello there. It's good to be back with you again as we consider the truths concerning bibliology. We're in lesson number three today, which is inerrancy and the infallibility of the scriptures. Now, those are two very distinct theological terms. We'll get into them as we go through the lesson today. Uh, but that's what this is about. And I would like to start, by way of introduction, in talking to you about cornerstone truths. Cornerstone truths, you know, are truths that are the basis or the foundation for, for other things. If we take that metaphor of the cornerstone, uh, we're looking at the cornerstone, that is the stone that goes on the corner of a building. You just say we're going to build a block building or a brick building, and you have to line the blocks up and get all of the walls straight you start with a cornerstone, and if the cornerstone is right, the lines can be straight. You can have perpendicular lines at the corner, and everything measures out well. However, <clears throat> if that cornerstone goes in a little bit, even a little bit crooked, and you're measuring the other uh, lines from it, by the time you get up four or five courses of blocks, you've got a big mess. And so, when we think of the cornerstones and the metaphor of cornerstones or cornerstone truths, we're talking about getting certain things right that go into the building of our edifice, we'll say the edifice of theology, and they have to be right because they affect everything else. And that's what inerrancy and infallibility are all about. If we don't have a clear view of inerrancy, and I would say if we don't hold to inerrancy, then this whole idea of studying the scriptures and finding truth uh, can be just thrown into a cocked hat. It doesn't mean a thing. We have to have the basis for inerrancy and infallibility right if we're to accept the scriptures as having any authority for truth or life. So let's get started. First of all, inerrancy. You probably heard that message, uh, that, uh, that uh, particular phrase or word different times as people have preached or taught you in the past. What does it mean? Well, it comes from the Latin word, irare, and that means to wander. Now, if you take that irare, in the positive sense, and then change it to the negative by adding the prefix I-N, or in, in before any root word, means not. It means not. So, if you say somebody is inarticulate, you mean they're not articulate. If something is inordinate, then it's not proper. And if it's inerrant, it means it is not with errors, or it's without errors. So that's the book definition of inerrancy. And I would like to just <clears throat> share a definition in regards to our course in the Bible. It goes like this. The Bible is without error on whatever topic it speaks. It's without error on whatever topic it speaks. Now in a few minutes we're going to talk about a segment of Christianity, so, so to speak, so-called, uh, that believes in qualified inerrancy. And that is a major issue, has been for the last number of years, 15 or 20 years, it's been a hot issue. And uh, we want to talk about that too, so we can have clarity in our minds about where we stand. The Bible is without error on whatever topic it speaks. Let me turn to a couple of scriptures as we start, and we'll launch into this. First of all, a very popular and well-known verse, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, if you would turn there. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped, for every good work. 
Last week we talked about inspiration. And we went into great depth about the fact that the Bible is inspired because it's breathed out by God. That's what the word inspired means. Breathed out by God. Peter tells us that, that the scripture didn't come from some of man's reasonings, but it was written as people were born along by the breath of the Holy Spirit in writing the scriptures. That really uh, helps us with our understanding of inerrancy, because we understand if it's breathed out by God, then it's truth coming from God. And how could it have error? Well, let's move on before I really develop that. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 4 is another scripture that we would like to look at. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name? Surely you know. And then verse 5. Every word of God proves true. Let me repeat that. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those that take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Now there are several things that we find here. Here's the, um, an important one. If the Bible has error, then God makes mistakes, because he breathed it through the writers of Scripture. Let me repeat that. If the Bible has errors, God makes mistakes because he was the one who breathed it through the writers onto the page. You see, that first scripture, all scriptures is breathed out by God, tells us that. And if we say that it's got some errors, then God must have given those errors, because he was the one that superintended the writing of the scripture. The second thing here is... Uh, the truth of God, if put to the refiner's fire, will not find any impurities rising to the surface. Now, that may sound completely out of context to you. So let me backtrack and look at Proverbs 30 and verse 5 in the King James Version, which is a better rendering of this. Every word of God is pure. The actual word here that's translated pure in the King James Version, or true in the ESV, is a word that describes the process that a metallurgist goes through when he takes some gold or silver or other metal and he wants to get the impurities out of it. They're called dross, of course. He wants to get the impurities out of it, so he submits it to the fire to heat. And placing it over the heat, he has a device that will allow the dross to separate from the silver or gold. Actually, it comes to the surface and he skims it off. That's the purifying of that metal. That is the word, or the metaphor, that's used here when the writer of the Proverbs says, every word of God is or proves pure. Hey, uh, he is a shield to those that take refuge in him. This is all about God. Truth is, if God's truth were put to the refiner's fire, and it was tested with the refiner's fire, we wouldn't find any impurity coming to the surface. That's what he's saying here. It proves true. There's no impurity coming to the surface. In other words, every word of God's word is perfect and pure. So, those are a couple of scriptures that lend to our understanding of inerrancy and why we believe in inerrancy. The Bible must be true because if it has error, then it's God's error, and God can't be in error. And the truth of God is pure. Try it with a refiner's fire, and you will not find anything wrong that comes to the surface. Well, let's talk about infallibility for a minute. I must uh, has, uh, haste to tell you that infallibility has to be tied with inerrancy every time. This is a relatively minor truth compared to inerrancy, and I'm only going to speak for a few minutes about it, uh, if any, any truth could be minor, but it is important. Uh, 
We're talking about the process here of the inspiration. And infallibility uh, means, and here's the definition, it is impossible for the writers of Scripture to record an error since they are led by God in their writing. I'll read it again. It is impossible for the writers of Scripture to record an error since they are led by God in their writing. Infallibility. The scriptures cannot contain any error because of the process of inspiration being God-breathed. And we must come back to God and who he is and his own authority. Let's turn to Psalm 19 and verse 9. And I'd like to read this for you. Psalm 19 and verses 9 through 11. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the dripping of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is a great reward. Now look at Psalm 19 and verse 12. Who could discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Who can discern his error? That's a rhetorical question. The answer, which is assumed to be no one. Who could find God's errors? No one. Now, why is that? Well, because if I could declare God an error, that places me at a higher authority than him. That's just impossible. And so the scripture puts out that rhetorical question there in Psalm 1912. Who could discern his errors? And of course, the answer is no one. So there is the infallibility of the scripture. As it has been given to us through inspiration, we know that the writers could write something in error because God was the one that was giving it to them. And two, God himself cannot be in error. Well, what is the importance of, of these doctrines? Why do we care? <laughs> uh, let's just talk about inerrancy first and authority. We're coming back now to the Bible's claim to have authority. What does inerrancy have to do with authority? Well, in Romans 3, 3, we have part of an answer here. Let's look at that, Romans 3, 3. Remember, inerrancy means that everything that the Bible speaks about is true and without error. Romans 3, 3 says this, What if some were unfaithful? Does their unfaithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Then God is unrighteous to inflict wrath upon us. I speak in a human way. But go back to, right to the beginning of verse 4. He says, uh, what if some were unfaithful? Uh, does that mean it nullifies the faithfulness of God? That's verse 3. Verse 4 says this, no, by no means. But let God be true, though everyone were a liar. King James says, let God be true and any, every man a liar. It wouldn't mean if every authority in the world gave a different answer than God's, God's answer would be true. Now, that's a powerful statement. God is a majority of one. His answers are always true because his word is always true. And the world may come up with other answers based on science or sociology or some other ology. Uh, but if they come up with a different answer than God's answer, it has to be false. Now, 
that you may be justified in your words, he says, in verse 4 and 5. That you may be justified in your words. I want to just point that out because he's really talking about the Word of God. And he's using it as a proof for the Word of God. God's Word is true, though every man were a liar. You know, there are some things, many things in the Scripture that I don't really fully understand. And when we come to some of the worldly answers uh, related to science in particular and evolution, sometimes that can be very confusing. They come on with such authority and present it as though it's a fact when it's only a theory. But you look at some of those things, such as evolution, and you realize that the starting point is 180 degrees from each other. The evolutionist says, there is no God. God did not create the world. The, the world is the product of a series of unbelievable coincidences. But God did not, God could not, because God is not. And the Christian in the Word of God says, God created all things. Because he is the creator. And he has all power. So we're not just talking about creation when we're talking about evolution. We're talking about our view of God. And it brings us right back to Romans 1, where we were last week, where we realized God gave them over because they refused to keep him in their minds. They refused to think about him. They refused to acknowledge that he could be real. So you have those problems. But there are other issues in the Bible. I'm still not... Sure, I understand. I remember a story that was told when we were visiting the Billy Graham Library there in Charlotte. What a wonderful place that is, by the way. If you ever have a chance to go there, please do. One of the stories they told about him came early in Billy Graham's ministry. He tells the story himself. He said, I was coming to a crisis point in my ministry where I was studying some scriptures that I simply did not understand or could not uh, put together with the things that science were teaching us. He said, one day I found myself out in the woods just praying. And the words came to my mouth something like this, Oh Lord, there are many things about you that I don't understand. But I am going to give them all to you. And though I don't understand them, I trust you because I believe you are the truth. And Billy said, after that day, I have never had a doubt. God fastened my faith to his anchor, and I have lived the rest of my life in ministry with a certainty that God's word is true. Isn't that a wonderful story? Well, we have to go by some of these times in our lives where we just don't get it, and understand that God could be true and everyone else a liar. But we need to believe God. We need to trust God. Let me give you two reasons that this uh, inerrancy is important. First of all, if the Bible is not inerrant, then there must be some higher authority to say what is true and what is not. Think about that. If the Bible is not <clears throat> without error, without inerrant, then there has to be some higher authority to say what is true and what's not. If I open my Bible and I'm not sure, I'm just not sure that it's all true, and I'm going to get something out of it, then who is it? Well, number two, if the Bible's not errant, one's private interpretation, hold that thought there a minute, one's private interpretation becomes the authority. Peter says, we didn't give you myths because the scriptures of no private interpretation. Paul said to Timothy, it's of no private uh, interpretation. But if the Bible's not inerrant, that's exactly what it is. Because if it's not inerrant, then there has to be a higher authority. Somebody's going to say whether it's true or not. Where does that place them? It places them above God. If I can look at the Bible and say, well, that part's not true, then it must be, I know better than God knows, even though God wrote the scripture. And if it's not inerrant, it comes down to my own private interpretation. And that's just wrong. 
because God wants us to take his word at face value. And then let's talk about inerrancy and interpretation. As we go through the scripture, we have to learn to interpret it. We're going to have another session or two that touch on that as we go through this course, how to interpret the Bible and to understand what are the rules of interpretation. So a whole field is involved with that called hermeneutics, one of the most helpful studies that I ever had in college and since then was hermeneutics, learning the correct way to translate, I mean, to, to interpret uh, the scripture, pardon me. Inerrancy and interpretation. What does the Bible being without error have to do with how we decide what it's saying? Well, if the Bible is not inerrant and infallible, everything is open to question. It's on sandy ground, so to speak, because if it's not inerrant and infallible, then we have all of these questions that would come up. Well, is this without error? Is this correct? Is this not correct? I guess I have to decide. The whole personal, private interpretation comes in. But then, what rules do we have for interpretation? We can't start off with, we know that what it says is true, then it changes the whole ball game because we're going to start by trying to figure out what's true and what's not true before we even begin to interpret it. And one of the rules of interpretation, for instance, is to compare scriptures with scripture. Well, what if I compare a scripture that I think is true with one I don't think is true? What kind of an answer am I going to come, come up with? I think the answer I'll come up with is that the one that's not true is going to influence my view of the one that's true. And so it creates all kinds of problems for interpretation. We need to be very careful about that. Now I said earlier I was going to speak about this, and so here we are. I want to talk about the debate with those who call themselves believers in qualified inerrancy. That's a term that you should be familiar with. There is a whole group of people that claim to be evangelicals that say, well, I believe in inerrancy, but maybe not 100%. Uh, there may be a few places. After all, the Bible you know, is certainly without error when it's talking about spiritual things, but when it addresses history or matters of science, well, then uh, I think we need to look at this because perhaps some of those ideas in the Bible were were taken from stories that were told by cultures back then. Uh, and on it goes. What are the arguments for qualified inerrancy? Well, first of all, there's the argument based on language. Based on language. Those proponents of qualified inerrancy point to the language of Scripture and say it could not be without error because it doesn't use specific language. They point to generalizations or estimates when it comes to numbers, for instance. And they say, the Bible speaks in, 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 in these generalizations or these estimates. They're not accurate numbers. If, Bible, if God was really giving them exactly the perfect number, then he wouldn't have said there were about 5,000 uh, people that came uh, to uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount or that received the bread, or 4,000. You know, the Bible speaks in, in round numbers. Uh, if, it, if it was inerrant, then God would have said, well, it's 4,132. At least that's their claim. And when it comes to generalization or rounded figures or estimates, uh, you know, the Bible might say at about that same time something was going on. Uh, that's to them... A problem because they feel if it, if it was really inerrant uh, everything would be very specific very exact uh, and yet you know in our own language we use generalizations often if I say to you I'll see you soon what does that mean well it's different than later but I haven't given you any number of hours or days have I and yet you wouldn't accuse me of of using poor English, if I say that, uh, not at all. The second basis for their arguments is based on content. 
And here is where the, 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 the rubber meets the road. Here's where the real problem is with this group. Their idea is that the Bible shared with the cultures of the time it was written certain myths, stories that they made up to explain their existence, to explain the creation. And you know, it is true that other than the Jewish stories, uh, have stories of creation. The Indians, American Indians or Native Americans, have stories of creation. Other people groups have stories of creation. It's remarkable how similar. Many people groups have stories of a universal flood. And so these people in this qualified inerrancy group would say, uh, maybe we shouldn't take those literally. Maybe we should look at them as stories that were borrowed from the people around them, and that they're myths, and that they have within them truths that can instruct us, uh, you know, much like the moral of the story, uh, but they are not literal historic truths. They're myths, and uh, they're used. Now, what are the answers to these problems uh, that the qualified inerrancy group advocates put before us? Well, I want to just put down this whole idea of myths right away. First Peter 1.16, I'm sorry, 2 Peter 1.16. I'll just read it for you. Uh, no need for you to turn there unless you want to. Here's what Peter writes. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, Two parts to that verse. We did not follow cleverly devised myths. All through the Pauline epistles, especially the pastoral epistles, Paul writes to Timothy, don't follow myths. Don't let them follow myths. Stay away from myths or stories uh, that people try to make up to try to explain things. You're not to follow myths. This is not what the gospel is all about. It's not about some mythological character in Jesus Christ. It's about a real historic person. And then the second part, he says, is when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitness of his majesty. And I think we need to understand here that when the Bible was written, even in the Old Testament and the histories, these were written by people who either were eyewitnesses of what was going on at that time or were receiving the stories as they were handed down from eyewitnesses, not made-up stories, not fiction. They were stories that were real stories that people had experienced and had passed on. And in fact, that was commanded by the Lord. Remember when they went across the river, God had them put a pillar of stones in the middle of it. And he, he said, now... What are these for? Well, when your children ask you, Daddy, what are those stones for? You can tell them how God led you out of the wilderness. He encouraged, God commanded and encouraged people to tell the stories generation to generation. He even had Moses write a song before they went into the promised land that was to be a reminder to them of what God expected and of their own sin. It was an encouragement, it was a requirement of God that he, we tell his stories because they were real stories, they were historical stories. So, we can't really buy into this qualified inerrancy. I will tell you my opinion, and I don't think there will be too many true b believers here that would disagree with me. I think that the proponents of qualified in inerrancy came up with that as an idea because they weren't willing to accept or to trust God with the literal truths of Scripture. And so, what does that make them? Well, it makes them, in some degree, unbelievers. Now, could they be Christians? Yes, they could be Christians and still have doubts. But I think uh, they need to have that Billy Graham experience. Lord, I don't understand it, but I trust you. And instead, they've tried to rationalize. And so, doing, more and more of the Scripture is declared to be errant, or departing from the truth, and less and less is inerrant. So we need to be very clear. 
The Bible clearly speaks against beliefs in myths. That's not what the Bible is about. And then secondly, history is an important part of God's revelation of himself. If you were in the Sunday school class last quarter, you heard me give expression every week to a different part of the character of God that was demonstrated by those vignettes, those stories of parts of the, uh, the journey, the exodus. And each time we had a lesson, we talked about what happened and then how that showed God's character. That's part of his revelation. We talked about that last uh, two weeks ago. And so if we we're to intended to use history as a means of understanding God, if he's using that as part of his revelation, then we need to have the correct history in order to come to the correct conclusion. And so history is important as a part of God's revelation, and that's one of the answers to qualified inerrancy. I believe that inerrancy is a cornerstone doctrine of our faith. If you don't believe that the scripture is true, all of them, to the extent of the fullness of scripture, then you really don't believe, then you have to start from a whole different point of view. And that turns your cornerstone in a different direction. And any effort to try to form a solid theology on that crooked cornerstone is doomed to fail. We must believe in inerrancy then and the infallibility of scripture. And you see, these both go along with inspiration. Revelation, inspiration, and inerrancy all support one another. God wants to be known. He reveals himself through the general revelation, through the special revelation, through the personal revelation of Jesus Christ. He reveals himself through the way he acts in history as we are able to see what that shows of him. And he reveals himself historically to different characters, such as Moses, as he was in the cleft of the rock. God wants to be known. And so we look at Revelation and see that this was coming from God as a means for us to know him. We look at inspiration and we see this is the means of presenting that special revelation in the word of God through the work of the Holy Spirit and breathing out God's word through the men that wrote it. And we understand because of who wrote it and because of the truth of God that inerrancy is inerrant to the words of Scripture and to all of the Scripture, the verbal plenary inspiration of God. They are each part of an integrated message. God's Word is true in every detail, and we can count on that. I hope this gives you a little bit more confidence and certainty. We want to have that to be what comes to you out of this lesson. The last thing in conclusion that I want to share with you is that the Bible has to be our authority. I spoke to that last week and telling you about my second most embarrassing experience. I'm not going to tell you another one, but uh, the Bible has to be our authority. It has to be our go-to book for all truth. If you're questioning a truth, don't go to some commentary, to some other book. Go to the scripture. Look up everything you can find in that, on that truth. When I was teaching Bible in high school years ago, we tried something a little bit different. And it, it just it was a blessing as we went through it. And you can do this too. I'll describe it to you. And if you want to do this, then I would love to hear how it's going for you. I had the young people have a Bible and a concordance. Now, we didn't have electronic concordances then. Uh, we had little paperback ones or big full concordances. A concordance is just a tool which takes a word and it finds every scripture that includes that word. And so I said to them, I want you to divide your page. I'll use the horizontal view. I want you to divide the page into three columns. In the first column, I want you to find a scripture that has to do with the topic. Maybe it's bibliology, and so you're going to see what the Bible says about itself. And uh, 
So you find that scripture that speaks about the Bible, says something about the Bible, and you write that verse out in the first column. In the second column, I want you to write a paraphrase, sort of like the Living Bible of that verse. Write a paraphrase. Try to put it in your own words, modern English. Then, very important, in the third column, you're going to put in a few words, no more, the truth that is taught by that scripture. The truth that is taught by that scripture. For instance, it might be if we're in bibliology, the scripture is Second Timothy, a passage that we talked about earlier, and you're going to paraphrase that, and then you're going to put over on the right-hand side in that right-hand column, the Bible is inspired. I said, I'm going to do that through every verse that you can find. I'm going to give you a lot of key words to look up. So they would jot down my 10 or 15 key words that I knew would take them to scriptures about the Bible. And you're going to take each one of those key words and you're going to look it up in the concordance. You're going to read the Bible. If it applies to truth about the Bible, then you're going to write it out. And then in the second column, you're going to paraphrase it. And in the right-hand column, you're going to have the truth. And we did that. I let them work on it at home. We worked on it during the Bible class for two weeks, each doctrine for two weeks. They would be working on their projects. They would be working on their pages. They were welcome to share with each other. There was no such thing as cheating in this class. I wanted them to get it. And then after two weeks, they were to turn their Bible project in. And then I taught for two weeks about the doctrine. And we did that, doctrine by doctrine by doctrine. Uh, there are seven major doctrines, or ten major doctrines, depending on which school of theology you go through. I think we took the ten in over 40 weeks. That's four weeks per. Uh, we were able to take the ten doctrines, and they were able to do this. It was amazing, because it caught fire with the students. You might think this is kind of drudgery, but the more they found that they could actually find the truth of Scripture and they could actually bring that out, and then they began to put it together in that right-hand column and begin to get a, a schemata of what that truth was, what the theology said. And then as they listened to me put it in a framework, they already had studied the Scriptures. And we had a number of those students from that class go to Baptist Bible College the following year. I got word back from the prof down there that taught Bible 101 that said, you know, the students from that school don't need my course. They've already got it. I began to get papers from those students that were 35 pages long. There was no requirement of the length of the, of the page. They got so excited about it that they were just getting into it, and it was longer and longer, and they were really diving into the Bible to find for themselves. Now, why did I give you that story. Because you see, the Bible has to be our go-to authority for all truth. And if you would determine to find out the truth for yourself, then when you get done, the Holy Spirit helps you to make that truth your own. You will never forget it. You will never lose it. And so it's important. And I want to just suggest that you might take this on as a project as we go through this and try some of the different doctrines. And uh, it would be a good project for you to do. It's also, the Bible is our authority for living. For living. As I said to you last week when I had that most, second most embarrassing experience, that was a point of departure for me because I came out of that experience with a decision between myself and the Lord that I would always, always base my decisions and my beliefs on the Bible and the Bible only. And it took several years before I even would come to the point where I could read uh, a commentary about it. I wanted to find out for myself what the Bible said. That was the richest time in my spiritual life, in my lifetime, those 10 years or so, where I was literally for the first time forming those doctrines in my mind. Now, I want you to understand something here. I was born again at age five in our church. 
a church to which my, my parents took all of us from almost the day we were born. I think I was in church with mom the day after I was born, if I got the story right. And uh, we were brought up in a wonderful Christian family. And we were in the church, a good church, all of those years. And yet, I never developed my own convictions until that 10-year span, when I was literally looking it up, ferreting it out, writing it out, and figuring it out through the help of the Holy Spirit. And then, when it came to decisions that I had to make, or my wife and I had to make, every time I have gone to the scripture and asked myself the question, does the Bible give me any instruction on this? Now, you might think, well, what, that's, what does the Bible have to do with that? Well, I want to just say everything, because I have been surprised at how many times the Bible gives me answers that I didn't even expect, or had specific principles that I could apply. And I want to challenge you in that regard, to make the Bible your authority for all that you believe and all that you live. And may you be blessed as you grow in the Word of God.